Welcome to Your Cases on Hold, a JBJS podcast hosted by Antonia Chen and Andrew Schoenfeld. Here, we discuss the science of each issue of JBJS with an additional dose of entertainment and pop culture. Take us with you in the gym, on the commute, or most certainly, whenever your case is on hold. Welcome back to Your Case is on Hold. This is episode 41, speaking on the September 6th issue of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. I am Andrew Schoenfeld, Deputy Editor for Methods at the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Harvard Medical School, my colleague. Victoria Chen. I'm just a peasant at the Harvard Medical School, here to serve in any way possible. Uh, I I will do. Antonia Chen is the Associate Professor uh, of Orthopedic Surgery at Harvard Medical School and the Chief of the Division of Arthroplasty. Um, So that means she outranks me. We just work together and have a good time. Yeah, that's right. Um, In a darker place in the world, there is a prison where people are sent to suffer. uh, And they go into that abyss. And sometimes the abyss sends something back. Uh, We're about to talk about another JBJS issue dealing heavily in artificial intelligence this time more on the chat GPT side of things. Uh, the There are going to be some hot takes. This has like a content warning, not for any like language or violence, but just on the hot take side. Uh, I think I'm going to be on the soapbox for a little while. So hopefully you bear with me and you guys can um, can learn something. But I definitely feel like the abyss is sending something back uh, at, at this point. The... Uh, AI and, and chat GPT has heard some of the things that we've said about it in earlier episodes. And um, now it's now it's like Jaws the Revenge. Um, uh, with that in mind, uh, as we always uh, say, uh, the comments, content, uh, and commentary are all our own and are not reflective of the uh, editorial board, the editor-in-chief, the other constituent editors, or the JBJS Board of Trustees. Um, This episode is uh, brought to you by CME at JBJS, Um, so do check that out for all your CME needs. Uh, Sign up for a bundle, um, get CME credit for for reading the journal and participating in in some some really uh, informative testing that can can help you uh, contextualize what you're reading and and applying it into practice. So do uh, check that out on jbjs.org, and then you can also pick up some JBJS uh, gear, uh, sweatshirt, t-shirt, polo, tie, uh, scarf, whatever it may be. Um, All your JBJS uh, clothing accoutrement is uh, there as well. So um, if uh, you're not already uh, liked uh, and subscribed, please uh, follow us. Um, Give us a five-star rating on Apple, uh, Cast uh, Cast Stitcher, uh, Amazon, um, Spotify, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, and uh, be sure to subscribe so you get all the notifications when new episodes or as it is bonus episodes, you know, may come out here here and there. I think Antonia said we're going to do a uh, bonus holiday episode um, with all of like the uh, with with all of our um, you know outtakes and things like that. Except we don't have any outtake because we do this all in one cut. It's just that amazing. Uh, so that probably it's won't be raw, I don't know. unfiltered version. No filters. You're right. All, all of uh, the foul language that has to get cut from when Antonia is talking. All right. So let's get into it. Uh, top of the pile, we have what's new in osteoporosis and fragility fractures. This is by Lane and is permanently free. Uh, Dr. Joseph Lane, um, really great individual at uh, HSS, has really contributed a lot to the way we think about osteoporosis and um, those types of insufficiency fractures. So, you know, you should definitely check out what he has to say. Then we have pregnancy hip pain and toe hip replacement by Garcia. And then we have What's Important, Ditch the Script by Van Kempen, also permanently free. And then we get into some of the AI stuff. We have large language models and orthopedic trauma, a cutting edge technology to enhance the field by Merrill and colleagues. 
And then we have artificial intelligence in orthopedic surgery. Can a large language model, quote unquote, write a believable orthopedic journal article? This is by Bramayer and colleagues. Um, both of those latter two bring some, some interesting insights, um, some of which I, I do agree with and, and some of which I, I don't. Um, the Bramayer article in particular is going to delve into an exercise in which um, the authors had chat GPT, I guess, or a similar program write two articles that were then submitted to JBJS and were reviewed without um, the reviewers and the, uh, the handling uh, editorial team were not aware that these were written uh, and, and represented actual, like it was not real science. It was made up. Um, the, the, some individuals managing JBGS were aware of that, but the, the individuals, the reviewers, and the, maybe the deputy editors that were handling it were not. Um, and, you know, I, I think this, we've touched on this a little bit before, and I'm interested in what you think about it, Antonia, as well, because, um, you know, the first thing is that chat GPT or any of these AI bots, whatever you want to call them, that use what whatever's on the internet to put something together or to write something, um, there it's not possible for them to create something new. They have to just repackage something in, you know, taking input from thousands and thousands of other papers. If you said, write a randomized control trial, uh, at least one of these was a randomized control trial, write a randomized control trial on hip fractures versus uh, on hip fractures, total hip versus closed reduction percutaneous pinning. It's going to look at the, you know, it's going to go into the ether, into the metaverse universe, whatever you want to call it. And it's going to put together something that is some kind of Frankenstein amalgamation, not as crudely put together as Frankenstein. It can actually be very elegantly put together. So I'm not talking about the, the aspects of like, but it is taking pieces and parts of other works and putting them together. I, the purpose of this, the, the exercise, what it shows is that chat GPT can write an article basically, but Antonia and I can write an article too. And, and I could fabricate an article. I could fabricate a randomized control trial and just write something up. It would probably take me about three hours. Chat GPT always seems to get the references wrong. I would get the references right. Take article and I could submit it to, to a, a journal. And I'm, you know, if you know what you're doing, if you have the, the as as chat gpt essentially does if you know what you're doing you know the pieces and parts of writing an article it's easier to write something fake than it is actually to write something le legitimate i i don't really what does it prove and and if i submitted an article and then i withdrew it and i said ah, i fooled all you guys faked you out ha you guys are, you guys you review you're going to accept an article that i wrote i made everything up i mean we actually have real examples i don't know about in the joint space maybe you could speak to that but um in in the in the spine surgery space, there was a very famous case about 10, 15 years ago, where um, a randomized trial supporting the use of OP2 BMP7, I believe, um, was completely fabricated. It, it was made up and it was published. And then a question came up about uh about you know certain patients who were enrolled in the trial or something like that and they went to one of the individuals who was listed as a contributor and and the individual said something to the effect of i have no idea what you're talking about we never did this randomized trial on on uh, op1 rather not um not op1 bmp7 um and it was a uh, you know an unmitigated disaster to say the least so again, it's if you're using chat GPT to sort of shortcut the system and, and write a paper faster for you, I, I, as I've mentioned before, 
I don't think that that's that's doing any good. Like, we are not interested in what Chat GPT is selecting papers for. If you're saying you're a subject matter expert and you have the expertise, then then you should be writing the expertise. It shouldn't be Chat GPT that's that that's you know doing the background work for you. And if obviously it's a non-starter if you're talking about writing something completely uh, fabricated. Um, again, you know we have. We have checkpoints. We have um, the the common like the, the the commonality, the accepted sort of what is appropriate and what isn't. And what isn't appropriate is obviously making things up. What also isn't appropriate is plagiarism, which this is essentially in some way. It, it's it's you know people say it's not because it's creating something new out of the work that other people are 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 doing, but. But it is work that other people are doing. It cannot create something. It's new to you. Like you went to, you know, it's not a new Lexus that you bought. It's a Lexus that somebody else had first that's been refurbished. That's really what it is. Um, and it can it can look like something new, but but it isn't actually new. It's there are no new ideas being generated by by AI. But that's a misconception. And I think a lot of this is like sensationalized overselling. And the other point is that if if we're fabricating something, the other is ghostwriting. So if I had Stephen King write uh, an article for me, you know, maybe it would really be great prose because Stephen King is a great writer. If I if I got sat down with Stephen King and I said, "Look, this is what this is the way you have to write a scientific article. Let's write something together," and he wrote the whole article, and then I didn't give him any credit for it, and I just submitted it, then I withdraw, withdraw it at the end and say, "Ha, you guys, you didn't even know that Stephen King wrote. It. How are people going to know that Stephen King wrote it? How are people going to know that I fabricated it? How are people going to know? How how are reviewers supposed to know that Chat GPT wrote something?" They're assuming that the individuals who submit articles are when they check all those boxes that say, yes, I meet the criteria for authorship, all those check boxes. And they're the, the they have the I we require, we have these safety checks at JBJS and many other journals. Where's your IRB approval? If it's a prospective randomized control trial, where's the NCT registration? So I, you know, those things didn't exist for this, presumably. So you had to have the the willing um, the willing participation of individuals who are facilitating this this exercise, if you will, and and I don't think it proves that an article would be accepted at JBGS written by ChatGPT. I think if someone tried to do this, it would eventually come out. Where's your IRB? Where's your National Clinical Trials Registration? You know, um, uh, clinicaltrials.gov registration. Where is you know, do the the uh, references match up? You know, the the authors comment. Oh, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, no one commented on the references. Well, a lot of times the references get checked. That's part of the journal's work to check that. Reviewers are going to check references in certain respects. If there's like some sensational statement or something to that effect, um, the reviewer's job is not. We don't task reviewers with you know make sure you know, if this is like, even if it's like, frankly, plagiarized, I, that usually comes out after the fact that comes out after it's published. And someone says, Hey, wait a minute. That's, that's, this is like taken like directly from like my work. Um, it's not at the time of, it's very rare that, that reviewers are going to identify um, material falsifications, plagiarism, any of these really bad red flag practices, because that's not their job. That's not what their focus is. You're asking a methodology reviewer to review the methodology. If they say, okay, yeah, you know, if, if, if it's completely fabricated, how can they know that? Our, our cultural wars are such that we assume if you're submitting an article, that article is, is, is yours, the work that reflects the work that was true and correct. And, and, and there are ramifications for that if you violate those cultural norms. So I, I think that it's really undefined what value <laughs> Um, I think like we've discussed with where artificial, you know, where they're talking about AI, using it as an analytic tool, it, it tends to be, you know, when you get the end result, it's a lot less impressive than, than what you say it is. And I get that. Yes, you can write an article that seems believable, but I'm just not sure what the, what that really proves. Cause I can write an article that seems believable too. And so can Antonia. It is a lot faster than gathering all that data and getting that patient information, let me tell you. So I have nothing to add except I support you for it. 
All right. Let's move into the headlines. We've got instrumented versus uninstrumented posterior lateral fusion for lumbar spondylolisthesis, a randomized controlled trial. This is by Andresen and uh, comes with a comment. So this is a, a study on a very hot topic in uh, spine um, that you know is comparing uh, instrumented versus uninstrumented posterior lateral fusion. This is something in the setting of spondylolisthesis where there's a presumed instability that um, has you know probably been addressed in various ways and in other trials over the course of at least the last 30 years. Um, so this study was conducted in, in Scandinavia. Um, they have a tendency to use instrumentation less than we do in the United States. Um, it was a randomized single center trial, symptomatic single level degenerative spondylolisthesis, one-to-one -one decompression and fusion with or without instrumentation. And um, they are looking at uh, ODI, patient reported outcomes, EQ5D for quality of life. And then, you know, most importantly, reoperation and fusion rates. So they had 54 subjects. Uh, the study checks all the boxes from a randomized controlled standpoint. Um, they found similar improvements in ODI, um, as well as many of the other outcome measures. Solid fusion was noted in 94% of the patients in the instrumented group and 31 in the uninstrumented group. So that's a major difference. Um, there was only one patient in the instrumented group as compared to seven that had reoperation within two years um, of the index surgery. So they found no difference in patient reported outcomes um, comparing the two, but a significantly higher rate of non-union and reoperation uh, at two years. Um, I, I think in spine surgery, as with many other surgeries, I think you'd agree with me from the joint side as well, the best time to get it right is the first time. That, you know, to do the surgery right the first time, you want to give the patient the best possible outcome. You don't want to have them have to come back for, for an, uh, another surgery. And we know that in the setting of spine surgery, when you have pseudarthrosis and effusion is not solid, and again, solid fusion on CT. So this is, you know, a, a relatively well-accepted gold standard way of defining fusion. 94% in the instrumented group. In the uninstrumented group, it was 31%. So we're talking about you know these revision surgeries only within two years, but then how many at five years? How many at seven years? It's much harder to do a revision surgery procedure. The ceiling in terms of, of um, benefit is, is much lower than it is for an index procedure. This is a debate that just seems to be ongoing. There have been a lot of randomized controlled trials in this space. Most of them do seem to fall into this ballpark, which is... Um, if you can get a successful out fusion with the non-instrumented group, the outcomes tend to be similar. Um, and then for those that fail, and it tends to be a higher number in the uninstrumented group, they need more care later on. And we don't, because it's a randomized control trial, you don't get to see sort of the longer term ramifications. They're not looked at. It's just sort of discussed either in passing or mentioned. Um, so I think this adds to a body of literature. It is Scandinavia. I don't think it necessarily fully translates to the American context. Uh, the gold standard um, in the U.S. is to use instrumentation, except in certain select populations um, where it may be riskier. Um, I think this you know, just reinforces what has been generally considered for the last 20 years to be kind of uh, a, a well-accepted practice, which is Instrumented fusion for spondylolisthesis tends to result in a higher fusion rate, and if not better patient reported outcomes, um, better uh, better quantitative outcomes in terms of a need for additional interventions and things along those lines. Get it right the first time. There's actually a whole campaign in the UK about that. So I agree. If you want to look at all right, a little bit different. I'm going to look at. Yeah, let's talk about VTED. <laughs> VTED combination of pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis increased risk of venous thromboembolism in patients with post operative anemia and total antiplastic are transfusion to boom by Liu et al. There's also a visual summary, so you can take a look at that. So 
we love to already know that we've all reduced the amount we transfuse after surgery. This has changed over time. I remember when I was a resident, we used to transfuse a little bit more. Now we transfuse even less. And a long time ago, they used to transfuse every single patient into went surgery. Let's say 20 years ago, most total joint surgery patients would, would receive a transfusion. And now it's very uncommon to transfusion, transfuse patients. So this study basically said, all right, if I compared three different groups of people, so a group of patients without acute blood loss anemia who didn't receive a transfusion, patients who got acute blood loss anemia but didn't get a transfusion, and those who had acute blood loss anemia and received a transfusion, if we compare the three, is the red blood cell transfusion the culprit here? This is using a Premier Health database, sorry, Premier Healthcare database that contained primary electrolytes, total hip and total knee arm classification from January 1st, 2015 to December 31st, 2020. So during that time frame, transfusion practices have changed, I would say. And interesting enough, too, also DVT prophylaxis has also changed in that time frame. So there are a few things with the methods that I'm curious about when it comes to the author. They said chronic blood loss anemia or chronic nutritional deficiency anemia were excluded. The problem is this is a big database. So those are normally just indicators in a column of whether or not there's a present or not present. But they don't actually have their um, hemoglobin hematocrit values. Um, for, you know, blood loss anemia or chronic levels or nutritional deficiency. You know, we don't know the vitamin B12 levels or the folate levels or the iron levels. And then how is anemia defined? You know, they basically have a column that says anemia, yes, no, after surgery. Um, but I'm curious what the H and H drop was in patients, um, what those actual values were. And the authors take, the authors didn't seem to take the cause of surgery into account, such as like avascular necrosis. They just excluded non-elective cases. So things like hip fractures and things like that. But since it's a big database that over 1,290,000 patients who were primary elective total joint arthroplasty, 64% were total knee arthroplasty, 34% approximately were total hip arthroplasty. Of those patients, as you can imagine, the majority did not get post-operative and did not get transfusion. That was 83.6%. 15.4% did get post-operative anemia, but didn't get a transfusion. And only 1.1% of the population got post-operative anemia and received a transfusion. Well, uh, because it's such a big database, 1.1% was still over 14,000 patients. I would say that transfusion rates have definitely decreased over time. Again, in this study, it's showing it's only 1.1% in the total joint patient population. And they found by separating the analysis between hips and knees that the findings were similar. People would probably argue that a total hip replacement probably loses a little more blood than a total knee replacement. But the findings were pretty similar between um, both different types of procedures. So they found that the anemia with transfusion cohort had the highest overall comorbidity rate highest rate of taking DOAX or the stronger anticoagulation, the lowest use of taking um, aspirin postoperatively, lowest use of tranexamic acid, and then higher rates of DVT, PE, errors combined, like VTE, even when controlling for confounders versus those with anemia without transfusion and also control. So the primary endpoint showed that those who received transfusion had higher rates of VTE even to patients who had post-operative anemia. They did multivariable regression analysis to account for confounders, such as age, sex, hospital factors, so age, sex, race, hospital factors, and comorbidities. They don't really specify what hospital factors mean. They say they do with hospital factors. And they find that, anyway, the DCE rate is a little bit higher. But the problem with this type of blood database study is that no one has an idea why a patient received a transfusion, right? We don't have any granular drill-down data. A patient could have a hemoglobin hematocrit of 13 um, hemoglobin of 13 and they get a transfusion. Um, was it warranted? Was the patient symptomatic? Was the patient not symptomatic? Were there other risk factors that predisposed patients to VTE that the patient presented with that led to transfusion? They did control for some comorbidities, but could they control all the comorbidities? So the author's take home message was saying patients with acute blood loss anemia who received a transfusion with increased risk of developing VTE followed TJA, whereas patients with anemia who did not receive a transfusion were not. And they're kind of implying a causation that if you get a transfusion, you have increased risk of VTE. But the key factor here is it has to be, there's a correlation, right? There's a correlation of individuals who get a transfusion who have increased risk of VTE, but not a causation. So, you know, there's, these are categorical valuable variables. There's no actual data. So it'd be nicer to see this in a um, granular hospital-based system. Yes, indeed. Um... I think that this this study does sort of tiptoe on the line of uh, making the uh, error of trying to use claims-based data to direct clinical practice. 
Um, I think, you know, because of the size of the data set and uh, it being a, a very modern, you know, 2015 to 2020 or the, the catchment uh, period, um, this, you know, it is some food for thought. I think there's a lot of concern around confounding by indication or selection bias that is not addressed by the multivariable uh, analyses that, that they conducted. Um, and it would probably be, there, there isn't a, a reasonable methodologic solution for this type of, you know, where it's just really the claims that are making the indication. You said, well, what do they mean by hospital factors? I think they're just controlling for the hospital where the work was done. They're not specific hospital factors that they are aware of. They're controlling for the site and saying, you know, the practices is unique to that particular site, the clustering that occurs at that particular site is accounted for and, and controlled for to the fullest extent possible. And that, that part is true. Um, I think orthopedic surgeons are already aware that there are risks of transfusion and that they probably do individualize the use of transfusion in their patients. Um, the, they, they probably could have just left that part out of the conclusion and just had the first part and, and that would have been fine. Um, you know, I think this work should be viewed as hypothesis generating, uh, not, not prescriptive. All right. Well. And again, now we're going to decide that. I was just saying, it would it would be easier to do the study without actually having to use a large database and just write a study without it. But it's the most appropriate way to use the database <laughs> instead of using it out. Yes. Sorry. Point uh, taken. <laughs> now we're going to go into the your case is on hold featurette. Is this case going to be put on hold? 30-day mortality and complication rates in total joint arthroplasty after a recent COVID-19 diagnosis, a retrospective cohort in the National COVID Cohort Collaborative. This is by Pinkovich and colleagues. There's a commentary. It is free for 30 days, so no excuses. Everyone can get their hands on this right now. You should check it out. It is interesting work. Um, I think it's kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we're going to see coming out in the next couple of years around um, Outcomes following COVID-19, obviously, over the last two and a half, three years, COVID-19 as a whole has been at the forefront. Uh, what these authors wanted to do is look at um, complications and mortality associated with undergoing toe joint arthroplasty with a recent COVID-19 diagnosis. So uh, this involved uh, total hips and total knees, um, and they were identified this national COVID cohort collaborative uh, data set. And the patients who had COVID-19 um, prior to the, the surgery um, and uh, were in one group, and then those who were negative uh, were in another. There's no differentiation between severity or acute, acuity of the illness uh, that they could comment on. Uh, and then they looked at complications, VTED, pneumonia, uh, acute MI, readmission, and 30-day mortality. So they have a lot of patients, uh, over 85,000 patients uh, who underwent one of these two procedures. 4% uh, of the population had a recent COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, those who had the diagnosis within two weeks of the total joint were at increased risk of pneumonia, uh, MI, sepsis, and 30-day mortality. Uh, mortality was elevated close to 11 times the odds. Uh, that's quite, quite impressive, a, a very, very high risk. Um, so, you know, basically they're like recent COVID-19, uh, don't do it. Uh, and, and that does seem to, to be um, a very reasonable conclusion here. Uh, we're not seeing longer term outcomes, uh, but those are probably not necessary in this context. It's definitely clear that patients who are getting total joints that close to a COVID-19 diagnosis are at elevated risk. I'm just wondering why did they decide to do, you know, what, what was the clinical decision in, in, in trying to move so, so aggressively? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting that decision on hold, not putting this, this uh, paper is not going on hold for sure. I think there's useful information here. It is of course, in the setting of COVID-19, there's a lot of uh, other constituent parameters, you know, were these patients vaccinated? How, how recently were they vaccinated? Um, what strain of COVID-19 is it? You know, what, when we're talking about dealing with the earlier variants that may have been more virulent and patients had uh, less immunity, that, that may not be the case now. But it just seems like, you know, we're, we're in today's day and age, like, let's be cautious. Let's be 
let's be careful. The one question is how long, right? How long do you wait? And that can't be answered. Uh, in the, what do you think? How long should they wait? Yeah, that's one of those interesting things where we talk to our anesthesia colleagues about that. And it used to be, in the, the guidelines changed throughout the whole pandemic, right? It used to be to wait eight months and then it became eight weeks. You know, it just becomes a, a moving target over time. Um, our big thing now is if the patient is symptomatic, so has any respiratory conditions or anything like that, respiratory symptoms, then we postpone surgery and get to be respiratory free symptoms for two weeks at least. So I'm curious if that number of two weeks maybe came from, right? They were thinking, well, they had COVID-19 and they were symptom free that afterwards, then they thought maybe it'd be okay to pursue surgery. So from a clinical decision making perspective, that's a tough one, right? Because if you're looking at a patient and they have no symptoms, or they haven't had symptoms with COVID, then you know, someone is safe to undergo surgery. And now, you know, based on this study, I would say, probably I'd rather be safe for than sorry than not do it in two weeks. Um, but I will say, as you say, the virulent ones, ones beforehand where people had major symptoms, undergoing surgery within two weeks was probably a little bit cavalier. Um, but if you don't have symptoms, that's where I think the two weeks. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just thinking about it. And not only did these like surgeons make the decision to go, but they convinced the anesthesia to let them go. <laughs> That's the wild part. I mean, the, the, they're the, the toughest ones. Anesthesia. Right. I, I, I think like, you know, we see like, uh, I mean, it's not everybody, but I, I, I certainly know of toe joint surgeons. They won't do, um, they won't do a replacement, a hip replacement or a knee replacement if the patient had an epidural steroid exposure. So that's like the intersection with my practice and theirs, you know, within three months. They don't want to have it within three months. So maybe three months certainly seems like a, a long time to wait post COVID, but, you know, maybe six weeks, like something more in that range, six to 12 weeks. I'm going to put that out there. This is totally, I get that it's not, it's not supported by any, by any scientific basis, but. Is this based off a chat GPT query that you have? Yeah. Now let me ask, let me ask chat GPT and that will tell us, um, that will give us the real answer. How long should you wait? It said, it said six weeks to three months. So. Wow. Good job. You are a robot. Yeah. I, I am chat GPT. Should have known. Me and, me and Ellen Musk. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other comments? No, completely. Does the case go on again. hold? I just said two weeks. That's a really quick turnaround. So I'm saying that goes on hold, but the actual study itself is not going on hold. So yeah. good use. Agreed. Good Agreed. Reach. We're on the same page there. All right. Let's go into the honorable mentions. So um, we have uh, pediatric orthopedic observerships in North America. For International Surgeons, a qualitative study exploring motivations, relevance, and alternate learning platforms by Carrillo and colleagues. This is permanently free. Um, increasingly, I'm sure you get a lot of uh, requests, and uh, I, I, I get at least one email a, a day from, from an international uh, orthopedic uh, or neurosurgical person, in my case, who's who's interested in doing an observership or coming to do some type of, you know, um, uh, insight you uh uh, research collaboration or something to that effect. But this is really good qualitative work um, that looks at, you know, what these individual individuals' motivations are, their relevance, and then, you know, what are different ways that that you can uh, make this a valuable uh, learning uh, experience. It is specific to the pediatric space in this context, but I think there's a lot that is translatable and generalizable. It is permanently free. So at any point, um, please do uh, take a look at that. Then we have sagittal alignment and total knee arthroplasty. Are there any discrepancies between robotic assisted and manual axis orientation by On and colleagues? This is a um, retrospective study of 60 full length CT scans of the lower extremities in 54 patients um, that involves the MAKO mechanical axes determined according to the MAKO total knee arthroplasty surgical guide. And compared with the manual total knee system, the MAKO system is more likely to result in a decreased posterior tibial slope and extension of the femoral prosthesis. They also postulate that it can influence the evaluation of the lower extremity extension and flexion when using the MAKO system. This is appropriately graded level four, but I think some interesting insights um, in terms of the way that... Um, sagittal uh, alignment determines extension and flexion of knee prostheses and the way that this can be defined uh, to a better degree. 
We then have a quantitative 3D CT demonstrates distal row pronation and translation and radiolunate arthritis in the snack wrist. This is by Mia Mura and is also uh, permanently free. So these authors uh, constructed 3D models of the carpal bones and radius from 51 patients with scaphoid nonunion and then uh, also 50 healthy controls in 3D geometric position of the distal carpal row relative to distal radius in the snack wrists. And um, a lot of really interesting insights for our hands. Insights into the way uh, scaphoid nonunion exhibits a unique deformity pattern and alterations in bone density distributions. Um, and uh, they they not only have you know clinical relevant findings, but also suggest some future studies uh, to build off of this in in a way that um, can can further add to the uh, effective understanding of this condition and care that can be provided to these individuals in the future. And then the last one is Taylor Osteoperiostic Grafting from the Iliac Crest called Topic, two-year prospective results of a novel press fit surgical technique for large complex osteochondral lesions of the medial talus. This is by Dahman and colleagues. It does have an infographic and is permanently free. Um, interestingly enough, uh, going back to, I think, 2010, I do have an article in... Um, JBJS, uh, where I was one of the co-authors, not the first or senior author, but one of the co-authors on osteochondral lesions of the talus. Um, I also have another separate paper where we described using fresh osteochondral allograft. So this brings me back to uh, to, to some of the earlier work I, I, I've done. Um, I thought it was a really interesting study. They have 43 patients uh, prospectively assessed before and 24 months after uh, this procedure, uh, describing their experience with the procedure. Um, it is a retrospective review of prospective data. It is a relatively small uh, number of patients, but they do conclude that the topic procedure for these types of osteochondral lesions of the medial Taylor dome is effective and uh, can result in significant improvement, exceeding the MCID and pain scores, as well as in other outcomes. They do report 100% consolidation of the grass, which is likely, you know, some something of a sampling error uh, may not necessarily translate across the board. Um, so everyone can check these out. That also is permanently free. So no excuses there. That brings us to the end of this uh, very informative uh, episode from the abyss. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, if you did and you're not already subscribed, do make sure you hit the notifications and uh, make sure that you're checking out back episodes as well as what's coming in the future. Um, if you didn't like what you heard and you, you want to use chat GPT for everything, uh, thanks for listening uh, this long. That case is definitely going on hold and um, we'll be here putting other cases on hold in the weeks to come. 